Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you on this Monday where uh, there's a lot going on. We're just over a week away from the start of spring football. K-State has a pretty significant basketball game that's taking place tonight after a good win over the weekend. So things are in a better place uh, for that. But we will focus on football, which is getting closer to the start of spring practice. It'll actually be exactly a week from today when uh, Chris Kleiman will speak for the first time this spring, kind of give a preview of everything. And then the next day they'll uh, kick things off with their practice and uh, quite a few opportunities this year. Did, did it feel like more than normal that we're going to get the opportunity as the media to see, you know, a chunk of practice or the start of things? Because it felt like at least one or two more sessions than uh, what's normally allotted to me. Yeah. N- yeah. And those are, you know, probably more position drill stuff and, and and things of that nature, not necessarily scrimmages, but it felt like overlooking that plan that was sent to us, obviously for, for media availabilities during spring ball. I think in terms of interview opportunities that seemed pretty similar or identical to past years, but that practice was going to be, a little more open and and obviously I don't know how much that really moves the needle on what we're seeing and not just because of what is typically available to us when they do open it up. Yeah, it'll be interesting to kind of see uh how how it looks and obviously you don't get a lot from that at times but there are some things you can kind of gleam and uh just it, it's it's good to see what's going on there and and how guys are working and then you know sometimes it's who isn't working at that point in time. So that'll be fascinating to see when it all gets underway next week. But uh, with that in mind, and as we get close to it, we're going to talk about some spring ball storylines for this K-State team because they come off a season last year where they win nine games. And when it's all said and done, it feels like nine games was kind of the floor of last year's team. Uh, And they may have they may have underachieved in some ways when you look at the record, uh, because you think of I mean, two of the losses in particular, you just showed up and did not play well at all, Oklahoma State and Iowa State. And then the other two games, you had a chance against Texas, and you had multiple chances against Missouri, who turned out to be a team that was good enough to win the Cotton Bowl. So K-State was a good football team last year. We know this, and I think there's just that little bitter taste of it could have been more than what it was. So you have that going in this season. You also have the big deal of, hey, it's Avery Johnson's time. He is the starting quarterback going into his sophomore year. And then you're replacing a lot of guys that have had ties to a Big 12 championship team two years ago now. So there's a lot going on with this team, some good young players in the program. So I'll let you fire it off, D.Y. What is the the first storyline that you're watching throughout spring ball? Yeah, we're doing three apiece, and I did – do a bonus one because I just thought of another. So, and I'll put that on the tail end because it's probably a good finishing point. Uh, first, I said ball security. Uh, you have a first year quarterback in Avery Johnson uh, and in a team that was a little bit turnover happy at times a year ago. And those, those things can sometimes, you know, nosedive a season uh, and nearly did last year. You got to think because some of those turnovers were probably, had a lot to do with the losses, especially the Oklahoma State one that comes to mind. I think there was four interceptions in that game. Um, And even those that weren't turnovers, that could have been. Like there was a ball, I think, thrown in the KU game that would have sunk the Sunflower Showdown in Lawrence for the Wildcats as well. Um, That would have been a pick six. So it's always uh, a tendency for that to rear its ugly head when you do have a first-year quarterback. Not that it will, but there's always potential for that. And you marry that also with the first-time primary play caller as well. And when you have a certain standard of excellence and a high level of expectations that you have to meet, uh, the one thing that can prevent you from getting to that level is turning the ball over and not forcing enough yourself. Well, in in that same vein, you talk about, ball security and everything else you have the Avery Johnson aspect too he, I mean he did he did really well in the yep. pop tarts bowl in terms of in controlling things but you played with the lead the entire time so maybe you know you don't have as much of the need to push things in that game and it's it's a one game sample size we're going to see what it looks like over the course of 12 games because if you think back to you know 2022 Will Howard had kind of eradicated his his really stupid balls 
Uh, they were still there, but they weren't as bad. He came out, I think, was kind of feeling himself in 2023, and it was back to the same Will Howard where he was going to give a defense at least one or two golden opportunities to take the ball away in the game. But in the same stretch as that, I'll throw this into the mix because this was one of my storylines. We know DJ Giddens can can carry the load at running back, but you're going to need somebody else to step up there. And when Treshawn Ward left for the transfer portal and ends up at Boston College and you haven't added anybody else there that has legitimate experience, I have a little bit of concern about the running back depth. So I'll be interested to see how it starts to develop behind him and then how they utilize guys other than DJ Giddens in the running game and then in turn, you know, in the passing game because the running backs can be heavily involved in that at times. I just think that's something to, to keep in mind because I think depth-related questions for this team, like I'm not anticipating DJ Giddens being banged up all the time, but you don't want him having to carry the ball 35 times or something. You want to be able to trust one or two other guys that can go in and give you a couple of carries and we'll see what it ends up looking like. But those guys at times can have their struggles of getting in. I mean, we saw Joe Jackson get, what, one carry last year, and it, it didn't go very well for him. So I think that's going to be what I'm most interested to, to watch, at least one of them uh, in spring balls. What do we hear with what's going on with the running backs behind DJ Giddens? Because we know he's great, but who steps up behind him? Yeah, two things there is, you know, when we did get to speak to Connor Riley and Matt Wells, I think it was – the end of January or the beginning of February. One thing that was asked about Riley, one thing that Riley was asked about was the running backs and, and if they were, you know, had any plans or intended to add anyone else. And he said they felt pretty comfortable with what they had. So that, that that's, you know, we haven't seen anything, but it's at least confidence coming from the coaching staff on that front. And additionally, I would say the, obviously the depth there behind DJ Giddens is really, really young. You're talking about, two true freshmen and a redshirt freshman essentially right with Joe Jackson and then Davon Rice and JB Price. So, but one thing to keep in mind is the running back position. It's the easiest, probably the easiest position on the field for a true freshman or a young player to play. That is true because I mean, it's, I don't want to oversimplify running back, but it can be a pretty simple position. The The only thing that would go with that though, is that you are going to have to replace a lot on the offensive line or at least, trust guys mm -hmm. to step up. So that does change things a little bit, but I, I get what you're saying. I just think it's going to be fascinating. And honestly, I anticipate one of the young guys probably taking the role and running with it when probably. they get the opportunity over the course of the season. Probably, or it's going to be maybe a role-dependent thing because some of those guys are pretty different in terms of what they are as a running back. I'm talking about we have Davon Rice, who's a little bit more diminutive in stature, but really explosive. And he's a true freshman that I think has a chance to see the field pretty early just because that's an element that Kansas State doesn't have an offense or didn't last year. Yeah. All right, number two for you. What's what's up next on your storylines? I, I want I'm, um, I'm gonna flip sides of the ball here. I said depth on defense, just because I think you know, if if Jay Clifton ends up not being uh, on the available for Kansas State this year at linebacker, then you do have some maybe a little bit of a question mark and inside linebacker and how that rotation looks like going forward. Um, and then you have Toby Osinsame moving to the defensive line, it sounds like. So, you know, there is some pieces there depth wise that are probably not proven yet in, in the back ends the same way, in my opinion. Right. Um, I feel really good about starters. I, I like Keenan Garber. I like Jacob Parrish. I like VJ Payne. I like Marquis Siegel. I haven't seen him play really. But I really like Jordan Riley, to be quite honest. That guy's a load and, and seems like he has a really good head on the shoulders and a really good disposition to be successful. He's the kind of guy I really think takes off and blossoms at Kansas State. So I'm not worried about that. It's the guys behind him because we were talking about, you know, we like Colby McAllister. So but that's one at safety. But who else is it? It's Jack Fabris maybe that hasn't played a lot. Some other guys that maybe haven't played a lot. Um, and then at corner, I think, you know, probably – like or the like the thought of some of those guys at corner and i even had to look so some of it is an unproven <laughs> yeah. group uh so we were talking about what probably what justice james uh and we'll see if what happens with tyler and alone he was a transfer they had last year hasn't played uh it's been banged up i don't know what the prospects look for him i know they like the red shirt freshman um and actually a sophomore because he, uh, yeah, he played special teams yeah can Thomas and donovan mcintosh but like secondary, 
the depth, I think they like the depth, but it's unproven. So we got to see it. And it's probably about the same thing at the linebacker spot. Uh, I don't know how the pieces are going to fit, but they seem to have plenty of linemen that can give you, you know, meaningful snap. So it's, it's the depth. And, and on top of that or reason why that rings a little bit more uh, powerful for me too, is like, it feels like these duds that they tend to like they're the defense has been kind of boomer bust now for two or three straight years under Joe Klanerman. And, and, and mm -hmm. it's not really a knock on him because I think he's been a really good defensive coordinator and can't say defense has been in what the top three or four in the big 12 every year, but there's always one or two games where it's like, Ooh, that looks bad. And it always seems like it's at the end of the season. So maybe that's when the depth catches up. Yeah, I, I that's, that's a good point. And I think, you know, you look around and you're right about like the corners. I, I think it's just so many of these guys where you can like the traits guys have and you can like some flashes, but you just don't really know until they're out there and they're in the heat of the moment. Uh, but I'll, this is another one that I'll piggyback off of with what I had on uh, number two on my list. And you kind of mentioned it where you feel good about the amount of guys they have on the defensive line. But I think one of the things that lacked last year was any real uh, – the defensive line wasn't overly impactful in my eyes, you know, and obviously that's somewhat unfair because you're coming off of a team that had Felix and DK Uzama. You had Eli Huggins on that team up the middle. Like you had more guys and and they made it easier for other dudes to stand out. But, you know, Khalid Duke wishing the best at the combine and then with the NFL stuff, but it feels like he kind of underwhelmed. Even I know that he dealt with injuries, but he underwhelmed in my eyes. I expected more from Brendan Mott last season, so I'm excited to see him come back and see what he can provide. But I'm excited and interested in seeing who stands out on the defensive line and who is kind of going to push themselves up because I don't think it's just like the incumbents that we talked about. The guys that you said, hey, there, there's solid depth there. I feel good about somebody being able to go out and give K-State something there. Are one of the, the, the fresher guys on this roster – either you know a redshirt freshman or somebody or one of the transfers in, are they going to be able to be the impact guy on the defensive line? Because I think K-State lacked that last year, and I think that's why so much of the pressure ended up going on a banged-up linebacker core or a secondary that had their weak spots at times. So I think a good defense starts with everything up front, and I think you need somebody that can kind of come through and be more of a game wrecker than what K-State had last season. Yeah, I think it's fair. They had, they had less splash plays from that group. Yeah, all right. Number three for you, what's up next? Uh, I went with the run-pass ratio. Just I'm just curious to how that offense looks. And under first-year offensive coordinator Connor Riley, how much of the run game do they rely on? How, how they utilize Avery Johnson, that stuff. So just the breakdown in the ratio from run to pass and, and how – if any noticeable differences there are between last year's offensive system and this one. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go back to offense uh, with mine as well here. You have what I would call a busy wide receiver room with a lot of guys that have done some things, but everybody I think has the opportunity to kind of shoot up and demand more targets or more opportunities on the field. Uh, because I think you have a lot of guys that have something to prove. Obviously, I, I feel that way about the two guys that have transferred in the last two years, Dante Cephas and Keegan Johnson. Jace Brown is going to be going into his sophomore year where, I mean, the last half of last season, he was huge for K-State. He was really good. How does he build upon that? But then, you know, if you have those guys ahead that don't really come through, Jaden Jackson made some plays last year. He made the decision to come back. Uh, that's going to be interesting to watch how this kind of busy wide receiver room with guys that I don't think have fully separated themselves from everybody else interacts this this spring and then how that carries into the lead up to the season and what it looks like from game one when the wide receivers take the field and what the percentage of reps looks like versus how it kind of carries on because last year what it looked like and what we got to for K-State through spring, through summer, into the start of the season, it was wildly different by pretty much like game four or five for this team. So I'm intrigued uh, to see how the wide receiver situation sorts itself out. Yeah. He had RJ Garcia, I think was a starter. Um, yeah. And then he fell out of the rotation almost all the way. 
You had Jaden Jackson, who was not a starter, then a starter, then not a starter. And some of that was health oriented, I know. But yeah, it was a kind of a kind of a room in flux a bit last year. Yeah. And, I, you know, you have young guys there, too, where uh, Trace Spivey got to play a few games last year. Uh, played a little bit against SEMO, made some grabs, and I think that there's a lot of like fan anticipation about what he can do. So it's not just guys at the top that have proven numbers. There are some guys that are younger that might be able to make a jump and be in that conversation. So I think just a lot of positional stuff that stands out and is interesting to me because I feel good about this K-State team. I think they're going to be pretty solid, but and this kind of goes to what you're talking about with depth. I feel good about them being able to put people out there that can give you some sort of production that's valuable, but who is going to be the person that goes overboard with that and is a no doubt about it producer for you, as opposed to we're just kind of plugging and playing and see what combo works for this game. So that's where the wide receivers fall into that boat for me. Yeah. I mean, Jaden Jackson's usage was kind of all over the place. Keegan Johnson had games where he didn't play because he was a little bit banged up. You had uh, R.J. Garcia go from starter to not playing, essentially, by the end of the season. And then I didn't even think about it, but Jace Brown, who was not playing at the beginning of the season, and is probably your best receiver by the end. So uh, not a lot of – it wasn't a very stable room, but you did have a spurt from a a very promising young player at the end. Hopefully Keegan Johnson has a fully healthy season and and you'll get something from Dante Cephas that you're expecting as well. And – you know, it's not hard to squint and see a pretty good wide receiver room, but um, they've had a hard time of realizing their potential the last few years. No doubt about it. All right. You, you said, oh, no, I, I probably am being a little too hard on the group that won the Big 12 title because that uh, Malik Knowles, yeah, Cade Warner. Philip Brooks. They and, they found themselves towards the end of that year. They they came together and that ended up being a pretty solid group. I think if you go and look. Uh, I, I did a bunch of this before last season or at the end of the 2022 season, but like I think you had to go back to like 2014, 2013 for some of those receiving totals that they were able to to lead up to a bunch of the you know just kind of oddball stats where it's like K State hadn't had three 400 you know yard wide receivers since this season or whatever that team accomplished it, so they they found themselves at the end and they came together to be pretty good, but. Yeah, and and then my bonus one that I kind of thought of when we were kind of rambling there at the beginning, (laughs) which I think is a good one to finish on, is that Kansas State won the Big 12 two years ago in the 2022 season. Last year in 2023, they were considered a Big 12 title contender, even though they fell short of that. And then this year, I think, I mean, you look at the win totals and everything, they're going to be considered a Big 12 title contender once again perhaps the favorite, at least alongside Utah. That's three years in a row now where Kansas State's being considered among the favorites for the Big 12 championship. And, you know, obviously in the heyday there, the the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, that wasn't – that wouldn't have been a shock. But now in this landscape of college football, college athletics, and what it's devolved into, I think that is a pretty impressive, you know – I know it's not necessarily accomplishing anything. It's just being project. It's just projections, but I, I think it at least shows you an impressive program in a time where it's in, where it's tough for a program like Kansas State to be impressive. Um, I'm not sure where if that's existed since that first era of Bill Snyder, unless 12 to 14 was that, but I'm not sure it was on this level. Yeah, it's weird because. Uh, 14, they had a chance to backdoor their way into a Big 12 title uh, to, to share uh, if they had just beaten Baylor and Waco the last day of the regular season. The, the but that, yeah, and that 13 team, like, you just didn't know what to expect because, obviously, you were going on from Colin Klein. So, and look, I, I mean, I was – I was a freshman in high school when all that was going on. So my, my memory on it probably isn't the best, but expectation wise, I don't anticipate it being the same, especially because the carryover uh, that you lost a lot of production from that 2012 team to 2013, at least at the top. I mean, you lost the two players of the year in the big 12 and Colin Klein and Arthur Brown. So I think just from that alone, people probably anticipated it, but you're right. Like this team, it's 2022. They win it. 
2023, a lot of people are like, look, they bring back a lot. The pieces should work. I think the math on that was good by people. You just didn't get the continuation of what we saw from some guys at the end of 2022, and not all the pieces worked together last year. And then you go into this year where maybe if this was the old Big 12, it wouldn't be viewed the same way, but this is the new Big 12, and Oklahoma and Texas are gone, who are you know going to have probably – good seasons next year or should in the sec and the other teams that are coming in it's really just utah because arizona would have been much higher on this but they're making the coaching change and we'll see how that works out even though they retain most of the talent so it, this is you're probably right this is probably for the first time since you know snyder 1.0 where you have this much sustained expectations from year to year for k-state football and i think it's all warranted because I think even as this team is young and you're going to rely on a sophomore quarterback and some of these other changes that have gone on, we talked about it when the schedule came out. You look up and down. It's going to be very few games where K-State isn't the favorite, and they're going to have the opportunity to go out and win every game and give themselves a chance to probably be a year ahead of schedule to play in the Big 12 championship game. Yeah, and, and if we're going to take it a step further, they'll, they might be the favorite in 25. They – I. We've talked about it. Uh, if they don't win it in 25, and that, obviously that means they don't do it in 24 either, it, it will feel like you kind of missed out and you didn't do what you needed to and kind of failed with the Avery Johnson era. I think next year there's no doubt that they should be, if not one of, not if not the favorite, at least the second favorite because I, they should be good. I will say they might be. We're saying that because that is your – year three, your best version of Avery Johnson. And it's totally justified, but I'm, but I'm just like, I I thought about like maybe the team as a whole. And then I'm thinking, well, your, your offensive line is probably going to be really good that year. And your tight ends will be really good. I'm not sure what receiver will look like that. That's probably uh, a crapshoot, but that defense might be, especially that secondary might be in total reload mode at that point. Yeah, well, uh, just get the transfer portal fired up already for 2025. Get get ready to go. See what you, you know can what I mean? do. There. There's a lot of guys yeah. on on the defense in for this 24 season that may not be there in 25. Yeah. Well, and that might be something that we have to adjust our math on and start to think a little bit harder on. Is is the Big 12 title window more likely to be this season or next season for K State? But I will say the a lot of those players I'm talking about like Uso's gone but but Damian but you have Alalio that could be back you have Banks and Stufflebean that could be back but those are guys that would typically be gone um you, you lose Austin Moore but and then you're get we don't know what's going on with Jake Clifton Desmond Purnell I mean those guys are in that mode where it's like they got to pick or stay and some of those guys do sometimes go so it'll be interesting. Like Jacob Parrish, the same thing. Um, Keenan Garber will be gone. Yeah, they, they'll have Jordan Riley will be gone. Marcus Siegel's probably gone. VJ Payne could be gone. But the thing is, there is a carrot there for some of those guys that have a decision to be made. If you probably you – now, this is – people are going to roll their eyes because this is the new wave of college sports – but you you basically lose a lot, use a, you can use a lot of your NIL towards player attention, give them a reason to stay because you're also dangling a carrot. It's like kind of what KU did this time. Not to say not to say K State wants to be a carbon copy of KU, but KU obviously used NIL resources more for player retention to kind of run it back and try to win a big ball championship with Jalen Daniels at quarterback in his final what what is probably his final year. K State will have the same opportunity, same carrot to dangle for the 25 season for a lot of these defensive players. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how it works out and, and to follow along. But obviously, like, the more I think about it, I just – history would suggest that because of some of the inexperience and the unknown that you're going to rely on in key spots for K-State this year, it would make a, a conference championship unlikely. But I do think the talent is there, and it's not out of the question. So it'll be interesting to watch moving forward through this year and obviously uh, unofficially – the 2024 season gets underway uh, next Tuesday when K-State has their first spring practice of the season on March 5th. So 
That will do it for Derek Young. I'm Mason Vogt. Thank you for watching this edition of the KSO Show. For more K-State Online content, head over to On3, find kstateonline.com, get everything you need to know, basketball, football, recruiting, uh, probably talk about you know parking situations at new stadiums like the Royals if they build one or the KC Current. Whatever you want, it's over on the foundation, our premium message board. So go be a member of K-State Online if you're not and uh, get everything and more than what you expect, including uh, also people asking about New Orleans, which I thought was the grossest city I'd ever been to. But congratulations to those that uh, really do enjoy it. We'll be back here tomorrow. We'll have uh, instant reaction also Monday night after K-State's game with West Virginia on the basketball court and more football content throughout the week as well. So we're out of here and we'll talk to you again.